The world had made a deal. In December, the world leaders came to an agreement to stop climate change. L'accord de Paris pour le climat est accepté. World leaders congratulated each other because lengthy negotiations had finally resulted in the decision to prevent a catastrophic warming of the earth. A political victory. But was it? This story tells us why now, after 20 years of ineffective negotiations, a climate agreement is finally in place. It's a story of numbers, of economic predictions and scientific theories about how our political leaders have been guided by one thing only. This is a story of money. Imagine this is in the Gulf. You're generating solar power more cheaply than you could generate from gas. The single thing that will you know, shift people off high carbon energy and into lower carbon energy is going to be the price. Prices above competitive markets, they need to be subsidies. When that situation is broken and free market decides to go for solar, it will break like a dam is broken. This is Backlight. Welcome to a future full of new energy. The ink on the climate agreement had hardly dried when in January the yearly World Future Energy Summit took place. In Abu Dhabi, world leaders, investors and businessmen assembled to talk about energy. Your Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed bin Sultan Al Nayan, ladies and gentlemen. But they didn't just talk about the climate agreement. The main topic was what had happened to the price of sustainable energy. We have made a good start. There has been remarkable progress on many fronts. The fall in prices for renewable energy, especially solar energy, and the emergence of new business models are bringing sustainable energy within reach. As a result of progressive advances in technology, policy, and finance, those solutions are reliable, efficient, and commercially competitive. We are seeing sustainable and clean technologies ramping up across all geographies, all industries, and in the most unusual places. Last year, while all eyes were on the Paris climate negotiations, just outside Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, history was being made. This solar energy plant has changed the world. Last year, a contract was signed to expand this solar plant. The new part of the plant will produce electricity more cheaply than gas plants. Sustainable energy experts all over the world were taken by surprise by the deal. Michael Liebreich is one of them, who since 2004 has been running Bloomberg New Energy Finance, a leading research agency for investors in sustainable energy. The Diwa solar project was really a wake-up call, particularly in the Middle East region, but really around the world, because it was an unsubsidized project, unsubsidized price, and it came in at 5.84 US cents per kilowatt hour. It opened the floodgates to a lot of countries saying, well, we would quite like a piece of that. So, solar energy which is cheaper than the electricity produced using cheap gas? The CEO of Dubai's electricity company, Diwa, was surprised when he heard the news. Uh, we are lucky and uh, it was floated at the right time. Mm -hmm. So we got the right price. The interest rate was down, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think uh, just we got the best price. You go to the big oil companies that produce reports on the future of energy, the Shells, the BPs, the Exxons, and so on, and they were at the time saying, oh, solar costs about 15 cents, 
And here was a project in Dubai that came in at less than six cents. So it was a wake-up call. I was not expected, really. I was here. Then I been informed that the tender were open. And I see Mr. Uh, the, uh, the Secretary General of ARENA. I, do, uh, I mean, he told me, Said, you are a benchmark in renewable. I said, what? Uh, because, you know, we are all very transparent. We put the prices on our website. And he said, he received 300 articles, you know, <laughs> about this price. So we are very pleased about the result and about this achievement. Imagine, this is in the Gulf. You're generating solar power more cheaply than you could generate from gas. It changes everything. The low price for electricity from solar energy has made the electricity company hungry for more. After a 200 megawatt expansion, there is to be a new expansion next year of 800 megawatt. And along with this deal, the Emirates have tripled their target for sustainable energy by 2020. My understanding is that the, what they've told those organizations, those companies bidding, is that they would expect it to be sub five cents, under five US cents per kilowatt hour. It changes everything. If solar is the cheapest single form of new power in a, in a country or in a region. Dubai is not the only place where solar energy is cheaper than fossil fuel electricity. All over the world, there are projects getting set to produce sustainable energy more cheaply than coal or gas plants. Australia, Chile, the state of California, Italy and Jordan have all reached the tipping point for the production of sustainable energy. And it doesn't stop there. In India, plans for a coal plant in Punjab were cancelled at the last minute because it was cheaper to cover the terrain with solar panels. It is expected that over the next few years, Mexico, Germany, Morocco, China and a number of American states can be added to the list of countries where sustainable energy will be cheaper. Deutsche Bank expects that in a few years, solar energy will be cheaper in 80% of the world. Mike Eckhart of Citibank, who's been active in the field of sustainable energy for 40 years, is not surprised. All of this is very predictable if you know manufacturing economics and um, all of my team in those days were engineers with MBAs, so they knew how to run these estimates. All this has been very predictable, actually. And the 70s was the beginning of all this, and I picked it up right at the beginning. But it's been driven really by the cost effectiveness of renewable energy, particularly renewable electricity, is what we're talking about. Just in these last three to five years, particularly five years, the cost of solar cells has dropped tremendously. Today, even though there are many incentives, many subsidies, many encouragements to use uh, renewable energy, uh, it's actually become cost com competitive on its own, uh, even without those. So it's good to have those, but uh, this is a very big success happening right now. I have never had any doubt that the costs of these technologies would come down. Uh, early in my career, um, one of the things I learned to do was to calculate experience curves. The experience curve, the way it works is every time you double the cumulative experience in a particular activity, the costs come down by a roughly fixed amount. And I've calculated them in my career for many, many industries. Of course, in semiconductors, there's the famous Moore's Law, which is the 50% you know, reduction uh, for every, in every 18 months. But that's really a special case in an industry which is doubling volume so, so, so quickly and so consistently in terms of the number of microchips and that, that you know, pervade everything around us. Um, that continues to grow at such a rate that the doublings happen very quickly. It's the same with whether it's the solar cells and panels or whether it's the inverters, or whether it's the software that you use to control it. Um, also, 
um, the wind turbines, you know, there's a lot of steel and concrete involved and that doesn't go down and cost quite as fast, but all of the wind specific components, all the software that manages it, the blades which are very specific, etc., that's all coming down in cost on these very consistent experience curves. The destination, that sense of inevitability, you have no doubt because it's just, just wait and then you'll reach that tipping point. Renewable energy is subject to manufacturing economics where all products go down in cost the more you make versus the competition, fossil fuels, are resource oriented, not manufacturing, and the cost of resources goes up the more you use. And so you fundamentally have two curves that we're going to cross, and they've crossed in the last five years, in particular the last three years. And so I've had a smile on my face for, for 20 years, and I knew this was going to be a big winner. Uh, if you really got into the numbers, and this, I said, this is unstoppable. I saw this coming, and it's just fantastic to be here now and to see it happening. And then wind turbine costs have really come down as they build bigger towers, longer blades, more efficient gearboxes, the whole thing has just improved. And so the cost of solar electricity, the electricity from solar energy, has dropped 80% in the last five years. The cost of wind electricity uh, has dropped 50% in the last five years. So in both cases, uh, the electricity from wind and solar has come into economic competitiveness Finally, to save us from climate change, the world needs to switch to sustainable energy. It is doable, but only if the energy becomes really cheap. There is one country where they have understood the urgency, China. There was the rise of a hugely important issue in China, which is air pollution in the cities. That is really a catastrophic situation, and hundreds of thousands of people's lives being blighted. Chang Xiang is a professor and director of the Chinese Institute for Energy, Environment and Economy in Beijing. But he too is a victim of the ever-increasing pollution. You 嗯，然后呢，你看那个雾霾，那就是看，就是你这个，呃，看那个能见度也非常低，就觉得这个这个这个这个确实感觉是不舒服了，孩子脖子是感觉身体的感觉不舒服。Most countries try to further the use of sustainable energy with a few subsidies here and there, but not China. Determined to take some major steps. China came up with a cunning plan to produce lots of solar panels and wind turbines. Well, it's their plan. The Chinese Communist Party has a hundred year plan. They set a plan where they would drive their economic growth with low-cost, 
coal-fired power to get wealthy. And then they would use their wealth to clean it up with clean energy. And so whereas the Chinese seemed like they were terrible people, they were actually implementing a plan knowingly that unfortunately they would be damaging the environment, but they bet that they would make such wealth they could then clean it up. They have goals like uh, last year they had a goal for 2020 of 100 gigawatts of solar PV and 200 gigawatts of wind by 2020. And this is a plan they gave in, in 2014. Well, they updated that plan this year. They normally don't do that, it's every five years, but they did a one year update, increasing both of them by 50 gigawatts. I mean, the US has eight gigawatts installed, right? And, and they're installing at 18 gigawatts a year. And oh my God, this is uh, fantastic what they're doing. And 250 gigawatts of wind by 2020. Uh, no, they're getting more aggressive with the plan because they see they can do it. During the next few years, China will speed up the transition to sustainable energy even further. But what's going on here? Why does China believe it can introduce wind and solar energy so much sooner than we in the West? China Jesama 在往前面点的时候这个下降是非常快的这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这个这
if it was subsidizing its, uh, that scale up, then that's the use of Chinese funds and we should thank them for it. We should also thank the Germans because they spent an enormous amount, tens if not hundreds of billions of euros, and that was the seed funding that justified those decisions over in China. Because of the scale up in production and the rapidly falling prices of wind and solar energy, the world of the big investors is beginning to turn its attention to what used to be called alternative energy. We see that investors that would have thought of investing in a wind farm as kind of weird and exotic and uh, somehow, you know, uh, high risk and, and so on, uh, we see them now, you know, much, much more comfortable. Jochen Wermut is a German investor who has been operating in sustainable energy for quite some time. He thinks the current price reductions will convince other large investors to invest in sustainable energy. And he has very large investment funds in mind, such as the funds of the Middle East oil states. The aim is to collect money, to convince uh, sovereign wealth funds to move billions, we hope. If you're sitting on, say, $2,000 billion worth of natural gas and $200 billion of cash, if you only allocated 1% of the assets to what I call the new industrial revolution, which is defined by competitive renewable power, greater resource efficiency, internet-enabled efficiency, decentralized power, they could actually be around in 10 years' time. All you see here is a joke. Every, everything, yeah. the tourism, the, the airline, everything disappears when oil disappears because it's too expensive to bring the food here, to heat the place, to cool the place. And they could be a leader in the new industrial revolution if they switch, but they have a very limited time horizon. Because in five years' time, all of their reserves have gone, and they haven't built the new reserves, new, new base of revenue, then they're gone. And for example, Saudi Arabia, with $600 billion reserves, $60 billion deficit, in 10 years' time they're broke. So if they don't switch, they may lose their future. So one shake taking one positive decision, that would be a great signal. 2003, it came with uh, then Minister of the Environment, Gabriel, was just here as well, and he said, you got to change to renewable, and he, they thought, uh, you're, you're just totally crazy. You know, it's 800 cents per kilowatt hour, you're completely crazy. Now you come back and say, sorry, it's now actually cheaper than oil. They say, yeah, oh, maybe you're right. So uh, it's a much easier story. And uh, what we need to do is explain to them that renewable power is so cheap uh, for power generation that there's no chance for oil, gas and coal. Um, but of course the life now is very easy. You know, oil comes off the ground, you do nothing, you drive your Ferrari to, to think hard and to, to build new things. So what's the chance? Uh, I don't know. I'd say 25%, very optimistic. My colleagues would say one in a hundred or one in a thousand. But I think uh, because it's human, yeah? People, people care to have a future. They care about having a home, home for the people. And I think if you talk to them about, like I've been to the wedding of some of these sheikhs, kiss each other on the nose, you know. I don't know, they're all nice guys. And uh, I think they don't like to kill the world. That was my hope. There are people like Fahad al Altia from Qatar, who studied the sustainability and came to the conclusion that only if they move to 100% renewable power to create as much desalinated water as they need to feed themselves, then they will be sustainable. If not, this is a, these are castles in the sand and everything here will disappear.
So some people have gotten it completely, but the leadership hasn't gotten it yet. So part of the work will be to do an aggressive media campaign. The world has changed dramatically. Uh, I've been investing in renewable power since 2000, and to last year was the year when the price of renewables fell below the price of coal, oil and gas. And as a result, the whole world we live in is about to change drastically. That's a shocking news that appeared in uh, last October when there was an open tender for the power for Dubai, and was won by a Diva uh, power plant at 5.65 cent per kilowatt hour. Oil would have to fall, to $10 a barrel to compete with this price of solar. 15 years ago, it was 100 times more expensive to get power from solar. So all these 15 years, there had to be subsidies for anybody in their right mind to put a solar panel on the roof. Now, in Germany, I ask myself, do I pay 20 cents to the government, or do I put a panel on my roof for 9 cents a kilowatt hour, plus a battery in the basement for 5 cents a kilowatt hour, and I'm free of the government. What are the issues and the issues in the Middle East in the next stage? Is there a fear from the air pollution? Is there a fear from the new technology and the new technology? And we're going to move on to the gas and the oil until the end. Is there a real development on the real world? So my recommendation to the Middle East is to become part of the solution. Invest heavily in companies in Europe that have the solution to provide cheap and resource efficient uh, production sources. What funds have you got under management? So under asset management we have 200 million and advice 5 billion. And what have you averaged for the funds? 30% at the moment. Long short strategy has averaged 25% per annum over the last decade. And what are you short? You short the non-renewables I presume? Exactly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So we've been able to make a lot of money and do a lot of good in the world. And you have to imagine this like a big dam. As long as the price is above competitive markets, there needs to be subsidies. When that situation is broken and free market decides to go for solar, it will break like a dam is broken. That transition from the incumbents in energy also enables social shifts, which are really long overdue. The energy industry is probably the most macho and socially backwards and corruption-ridden industry in the world. That's not even a controversial statement. That you could prove that just by, by reading a, you know, a newspaper. This reduction in the price of sustainable energy is causing the reshuffling of many a deck all over the world. New major investors are seeing solar panels and wind turbines in a different light. I used to hear a lot about how, you know, in theory, investor X or bank Y would love to invest in clean energy, but it was so risky, it was too risky. And obviously I was looking at it and thinking, well, the technology is not risky, and it might be a bit more windy, less windy, more sunny, less sunny, on a, but you can, you can deal with that. That's a, that. There's statistics, there's weather forecasting, there's insurance and so on. And it always struck me as an oddity because those same investors would wake up owning a big chunk of BP after the Macondo spill, or they'd wake up owning a big chunk of TEPCO after the Fukushima uh, accident. Um, and they didn't seem to see that what they were actually doing was much more risky than investing in clean energy. The single most important thing that changed it was Warren Buffett in the US started to invest in wind and solar. He didn't invest in technology, he just bought projects. 
And that opened a lot of mainstream investors' eyes because they said, hang on a second, this isn't just a bunch of you know, tree huggers saying we should invest in this and accept lower returns because it's the right thing to do for the world. This is Warren Buffett building a massive portfolio of wind and solar projects. Let's have a look at what he's doing. Now that the tipping point for sustainable energy has been reached, the big bucks of investors such as pension funds are flowing towards sustainable energy. And all this money must be steered in the right direction. The major new innovations in sustainable energy are no longer to be found only on the exhibition floor, but upstairs behind closed doors where financial masterminds and clever investors are working to reduce its price yet more. We now face the real pool of capital in the world. And arguably there's different numbers, but there's something like 130 trillion to 150 trillion dollars equivalent of capital in the hands of these institutional investors. That's the pool of capital in the world. That's all the wealth of the world is out there uh, in these institutional investors. And we are gaining access to that. So we're literally having a higher supply of capital. It's not just chasing capital, they're also allocating to us. More capital is available. In fact, they now complain uh, that there aren't enough uh, green investments for them because they've allocated so much capital. So that's a good problem to have. The interest of the capital markets, the stock market investors, the bond market investors, the pension funds, the insurance company investors, the, the managed funds, the private equity funds, and so forth, uh, the, where the large capital is, and it's extremely sophisticated, and they are not going to move their criteria because solar energy is nice. Solar energy has to meet their criteria. Did I personally participate in creating the green bond market uh, in the last two years only? It's brand new, but very famous already, very successful. Where Solar City was the first solar securitization done in 2013. So huge innovations in that. It all came together. There were teams of people like myself actively working to crack the code, solve these problems, match with the capital market requirement, package these things. It's like a new architecture or new buildings or whatever. This is new finance and it's for the good. The combination of China's scaling up and financial innovations on Wall Street is resulting in rapidly falling prices for sustainable energy. In the Middle East, solar energy is so cheap that it's being used for the extraction of oil in Oman, for instance, solar energy is being used to pump up heavy oil when this used to be done with natural gas. The price of wind and solar energy hasn't bottomed out yet. It is expected that over the next few years, prices will drop substantially. But even if wind and solar energy becomes dirt cheap, we're still not where we want to be. Never forget, we have to talk about the system, because as you get more and more renewable energy, intermittent energy in the system. So you've got to invest elsewhere in the system, in the grid, perhaps in power storage, in order to continue to operate. It's about um, ecosystem changes, where you can do some of this, and then that enables that, and then you can do some of the other, and then this changes, and so on. Um, it's, so it's, to use Facebook terminology, it's complicated. Now that sustainable energy will become permanently cheaper than energy from fossil fuels, more attention is being paid to avoiding fluctuations in the electricity supply. In Utrecht, the Netherlands, Robin Berg thinks he has found a solution. He wants to use the battery packs of locally based electric cars to store the cheap solar electricity produced by all the local solar panels and to use it in local homes when the sun isn't shining. Uh, this zijn uh, panelen zijn inmiddels 50 jaar oud. En, en waarom heb je die vervangen? Nou, ik wou meer productie, dus ik heb nu uh, nieuwe panelen op het dak gezet uh, afgelopen uh, jaar. En we hebben nu op hetzelfde dak zes keer zoveel opbrengst. We produceren nu eigenlijk veel te veel stroom voor ons eigen huishoudenverbruik. Dus vandaar dat we met die elektrische auto's ook aan de slag zijn gegaan. Ons plan is om zoveel mogelijk met eigen zonne-energie en elektrische auto's 
de eigen stroomvoorziening te doen. Dus overdag schijnt de zon, slaat op in de batterijen van die auto's. En de eindgebruikers van die auto's geven aan hoeveel ze moeten rijden. Dus dat deel komen we niet aan. En de rest van de batterijen gebruiken we om de energie in de wijk uh, terug te leveren. En je ziet eigenlijk dat die auto's steeds grotere batterijen krijgen. De actieradius gaat nu van 100 naar 200, weer een kort naar 300 kilometer. Je hebt ook al auto's 400, 500 kilometer actieradius. Die batterijen zijn zo groot, daar kun je een huis in Nederland twee weken mee van stroom voorzien. En die zijn zo groot dat je hem niet meer helemaal gebruikt voor je ritten. Dus eigenlijk hou je zeg maar een helft tot twee derde van je batterij over waar je andere dingen mee kan doen. Nou, als je dat combineert, dan denk je van ja, dat is logisch. Ik heb overdag zonne-energie en die sla ik op mijn auto. Ik rijd ermee, maar dan hou ik over. En dat stukje gebruik ik om s'avonds mijn huis mee van stroom te voorzien. En sterker nog, ook de buurman en de buurman ernaast. De netbeheerder is nu een laadpunt aan het aansluiten, waarvan we nu 20 nieuwe in de wijk hebben gezet. En dit zijn de laadpunten die dus twee kanten uit kunnen, laden en ontladen. En uh, deze maken ook gebruik van zonne-energie die in de wijk wordt opgewekt. Je kan dan via je appje aangeven van je mag mijn batterij gebruiken of niet. En uh, al naar gelang hoeveel stroom je in je batterij hebt zitten, gaat hij dan uh, kijken van joh, is er stroom beschikbaar? Dan ga ik het nu erin stoppen of juist andersom. Nou, wat we eigenlijk willen is dat je toewerkt naar een wijk waar je, waar je volledig die autobatterij op deze manier inzet. Voor Lombok heb je ongeveer 200 auto's nodig, elektrisch, om dat energiesysteem te kunnen draaien. Er zijn 2000 parkeerplekken in de wijk, dus dat is ruim voldoende. Dus wat onze stappen nu zijn, is om eerst met die 20 laadpalen dit te testen en dan vervolgens uit te breiden naar die 200. Nou, en zo krijg je eigenlijk een wijkenergiesysteem die voor een groot deel de eigen energievoorziening doet. Maar uiteindelijk wordt dit wel de basis van je energiesysteem. En niet meer die kolencentrale op de maasvlakte staat. Maar gewoon eigen opwerking en opslag. This new energy system in Utrecht is a first in Europe. The project is still in its start-up phase. But what is to start with 20 car charging stations will expand rapidly to a storage system using 200 electric cars. And as the system grows, it will only work better. Door het samen te doen, ga je elkaar helpen en kun je het systeem afmaken. Want inderdaad, dit microsysteempje werkt leuk, maar als die auto er niet is of er is een paar dagen geen zonne-energie, dan heb je weer de rest nodig, zeg maar. Terwijl de jaarbeurs hier naast de wijk, die wil de komende tien jaar 12.000 vierkante meter zonne-energie gaan plaatsen op al hun nieuwe hallen. En die zijn een parkeerterrein aan het bouwen voor 6.000 parkeerplaatsen, een nieuw parkeerterrein voor de stad. En 3.000 daarvan gaan ze elektrificeren, dus er komen laadpunten. Nou, als ik dan inderdaad even geen stroom heb, nou, dan kan ik bij hun terecht om die stroom wel te krijgen. Nou, en dan ontstaat er een stedelijk energiesysteem wat de wijk overstijgt. En wat dus elkaar gaat helpen om het af te maken. Now that the prices of solar panels and wind turbines are less of a problem, more emphasis is being placed on finding solutions to deal with the fluctuations in electricity production. But here on El Hierro, the smallest of the Canary Islands, they have solved the problem already. To Jochen Vermoet, investor in sustainable energy projects, this small island is the ideal spot to experience a world that will operate totally on sustainable energy. They have uh, done a miracle. They are maybe the first community to be 100% renewable powered. They build a 113 gigawatt battery. It's amazing because I guess they're an island and they have this amazing leadership and they're going for it. Not just renewable power, but all of it. No waste, biological farming, great stuff. How are you? Fine. <laughs> okay. So we have a wonderful view here. The island has come up with a clever way of storing excess energy. 
They use a lake at the top of a mountain and a water reservoir at the bottom. When there isn't enough wind, they drain the lake into the reservoir, thus generating electricity. This is uh, very important for the island, uh, not only for, for the electricity, but even for, for the supply of water. If this reservoir is full, we are able to have energy for four days without wind. The project of uh, Gorona del Viento started with the idea to be 100% uh, renewal on uh, electricity. The island is very far, we are very, very small. Fuels are uh, expensive and uh, also are pollutant. So fuels has, uh, help us to, to develop. But uh, I think that uh, at this moment, if we have a better solution, we don't have to stay on the past. To see you. I think uh, when Columbus was here, mm -hmm. it was the end of the world, mm -hmm. but also the beginning. No, he was on the way to the new world. Mm -hmm. So I think the logo for El Hero could be uh, El Hero uh, on the way to the new world. Huh? Mm -hmm. El nuevo mundo, sí. Sí, yes. El Hero on, on the way to the new world. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I think it's all beneficial. I don't think there's a single negative to the transition to clean energy. First of all, a wind farm or a solar project is going to last at least for the life of the financing and maybe two or three times that. These might last 40 years, 60, uh, even 100 years for solar projects. And that stabilizes economics. Basically, you know your cost of electricity for the life of that plant. You're not going to have natural gas prices spiking and then dropping coal prices going up and down, and it's a stabilizing factor for every country that really gets a high percentage from renewable energy. The more energy we produce from renewable energy is money that stays on the island, because if we don't have to pay for gas or fuels that came from outside, the money stays on the island. Every step we made, we have uh, looked for other experience. Yeah. Uh, what uh, someone has made on wind, uh, what uh, any other place has made on waste or on organic agriculture. And so we took uh, inspiration from them and adapt to the conditions of the island. And and now, now you can export your inspiration to the world. You can make the whole world renewable like this, super. A bit more solar, a bit electric cars, and you're perfectly independent. Huh? I do sense that the forces that act towards a geopolitical destabilization and violence are lessened the more we put in a re clean and renewable energy. It sort of, it doesn't take it away, but it, it diminishes it, reduces it. So more stable economy and maybe more peace. I do sense that that's a possibility. If you say you can produce clean energy, uh, you can save money, you can create employments for you or for your family. Uh, all of that are advantages that they can touch, they can see. That's the strategy we must use. There's a tipping point, and you see this also, particularly with solar rooftops. So once you get a lot of homeowners who have them, it's very much more difficult for a politician to you know, to say, oh, you know, this is all alternative and silly and it's not mainstream and it's never going to work and so on, because more and more people have the technology and it does work and it does reduce their bills. 
and they expect their politicians to be on board. We feel happy when we see that the sea is a little bit rough. Before we were uh, asking for calms for go fishing, but now every, every weather has its advantages. It's totally humbling and ridiculous that we are in a place where people are, I don't know, they, uh, they didn't have electricity in 82. Mm -hmm. They are driving cars for 10,000 euros. Wherever you go, they give you bananas for free or food for free or unpretentious. And they're way ahead of us, way ahead of us. And uh, they are committed because they know for the future of their children, the island, we need to do something. If these guys can do it, we can do it. And by the way, uh, I'm delaying my retirement uh, now two years so far, uh, just because I'm having so much fun. <laughs>